So I'm Kate from, and I'm a part of the farming team at the Soil Association. And just so you know, just for the few out there who might not be aware of, of who we are, we're um, a charity focusing on the transforming the way we eat, farm and care for our natural world. And we're really actively working with farmers and policymakers to achieve um, sort of regeneration, to build a world with good health in balance with nature and a safe climate. And we have our own organic certification and standards and, um, and we've been working you know, tirelessly with our, within all our organic farmers and trying to support them through this transition. And one way that we've been doing that is through uh, the delivery of a DEFRA funded future farming resilience pilot called Taking Stock. And that's been supporting um, particularly our organic beef and sheep farmers, but you know, wider um, farmers as well through this transition, trying to keep them informed and trying to help support them as they adapt to change. Um, we've got a resource booklet and a top 10 things to think about um, in order to navigate through this transition period and trying to keep abreast of all of the changes and all of the new um, information coming out from DEFRA and uh, my colleague Helen who's uh, very kindly looking after the chat and things for us today um, I'm sure at some point we'll pop some details in the chat uh, about that program and um, and how you might be able to get involved and just on that note in terms of keeping you informed I just want to highlight that DEFRA have just announced funding to support a further 7,000 farm businesses few business resilience funding so it really does highlight that you know you you gotta you gotta keep your finger on the pulse in terms of what money and what possible opportunities are out there to support you um, because you know you've got to embrace it all that they're offering us. So um, my co-chair today is Keith Halstead from the uh, Prince's Countryside Fund and, and I'll pass over to Keith in a minute and he'll introduce himself but I just wanted to quickly run through um, how we're going to run the session this afternoon. So we've got three excellent speakers um, who are going to talk to you all for a little while and there's two uh, full-time farmers who are going to reflect on their farm businesses and how they've been focusing on how they can make themselves resilient uh, within the, the the changing world that we're in and then thirdly we've got um, Liz Jennifer who's both a farmer but then also uh, works and advises farmers and she's going to give us a bit of food for thought on habits for effective and sustainable farms that you know the things that people need to be adopting and looking at going forward so each of our speakers are going to talk for about 10 minutes and then we're going to have um, lots of time for questions at the end. So regarding questions, I'm sure hopefully you'll all be quite familiar now. If you could pop your questions into the chat and then um, as I say, Helen's gonna um, monitor them for us. And also um, uh, Dora, the lovely lady is gonna be able to manage any um, sort of technical queries that you've got. So anything like that, Dora will be in touch. And then once we've gone through, our speakers have all um, told us their little bit of a story, well then, um, put some questions to them. So we'll look to wind up um, within the hour at five, but we do then have that spill over half an hour um, afterwards. So if there's things that you'd like to particularly talk to some of the speakers about, then there's opportunity there. Or, you know, if we've got trillions of questions, obviously we can spill over as we need to. So that is the general plan. So um, I will pass over to, um, to Keith now and he'll introduce uh, his uh, farming resilience program and also Lizzie our first speaker over to you Keith lovely thanks very much uh, Kate and uh, good afternoon everyone um, from uh, a snowy Scottish location um, in East Lothian uh, but good to be with you today um, I joined the uh, Princess Countryside Fund back in uh, June this year uh, so I lived a, a virtual life most of that uh, that that time so i'm very much looking forward to later in 2021 when there'll be an opportunity to get out and about more uh, prior to joining the princess countryside fund um, i worked for the national trust in england and wales and for the national trust in scotland uh, as a regional director moving on to the uh, princess countryside fund uh, it was established by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales in 2010 uh, and we are a charity whose mission really is to ensure a vibrant rural economy uh, with good services and a strong resilient farming sector at its heart. 
Uh, we recognise that long-term sustainability for the countryside goes hand in hand with a healthy commercial <laughs> outlook and that good prisoners practices deliver environmental, economic and social benefits to the whole community. Uh, as a practical hands-on charity, we cover the whole of the UK. And as we enter our 11th year, we will have invested around 10 million pounds through over 400 grants to grassroots organizations, helping village shops and pubs, community groups, rural training organizations, and many farming networks across the UK. We also commission academic research and convene groups on a variety of subjects, highlighting rural issues through advocacy and publications. And for example, this spring, we will be publishing research on the social value of auction marts and relaunching our village survival guide. However, at the center of the fund is our work in helping family farms. They are the bedrock of Britain's rural communities and play a vital role socially, environmentally, culturally and economically. Yet they are particularly at risk. We know the majority are already making a loss from farming alone. And as we embark on the most significant changes to agriculture policy in living memory, it will be absolutely essential for farms to run as efficient businesses, open, able and willing to adopt new practices if they are to remain sustainable for the future. This is where the Prince's Farm Resilience Programme can make a positive difference. We recruit and support small family farms and provide them with skills training uh, to help their businesses become more resilient. Since the programme began in 2016, we have helped nearly a thousand mixed and livestock farms across the UK. And this unique programme has a fantastic record of evident success in helping families come together to determine the changes they need to make and putting farmers back in the driving seat with the tools and the confidence to effect change that is right for them. The programme has evolved and we've recently enhanced it with new workshops which help farmers to manage uh, their farmed environment, helping them to identify and benefit from the environmental assets they possess. Farmer feedback has also prompted us to evolve the programme to continue our support. And in November, we launched an alumni network for businesses that have taken part in the resilience program. This will involve a continuation of social and educational events and provide a mechanism to bring farmers together in their locality and collectively respond to the agricultural transition, which is now underway. One of those farmers who took part in our Princess Farm Resilience Program is Lizzie Clough. And Lizzie and her husband, Martin, have a mixed farm in Lincolnshire with 100 suckler cows and 200 sheep, plus an arable enterprise across about 700 acres. Lizzie and Martin farm uh, with her husband's parents and they have a couple of small children too. So a family farm in every sense. Since participating in the Princess Farm Resilience Programme, Lizzie and Martin have been looking at ways to ensure their cattle enterprise can be profitable without subsidy in future. So I'm going to hand over now to Lizzie to tell you more about that journey uh, and how she has progressed uh, from the position at which uh, you join the Resilience Programme, Lizzie. So over to you. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, just bear with me for one moment where we move on to sharing my screen now. Uh, I obviously am primarily a farmer, but we should be able to magically, through a bit of resilience and knowledge, turn our hand to a bit of technology. So hopefully you can all see that. Uh, that is my husband and I, where we first started off. Uh, I went to him through a young farmers competition to learn how to train a heifer for a Lincoln Red pedigree class at our local county show. I did it deliberately because I fancy the pants off him and about eight or nine years later I managed to persuade him to marry me. Um, I wasn't really primarily interested in the farm, I don't know what it was 
that made us click, but uh, thank goodness it did. And 10 years later, sort of I'm here on the farm and trying to work out what the right thing is for us to move forwards to ensure that we can have a happy life on a farm and our children can enjoy it and maybe one day would like to come and join us. As you said, uh, Martin is the fourth generation of his family to farm here. So I'm a relative newbie having been here 10 years. Uh, they've been here about 120 years. Um, they've got 300 acres of arable cropping. The rest is generally pasture. We've got over 100 pedigree Lincoln red cows now. 250 commercial ewes. Now, almost all of our grazing is on permanent pasture on this medieval ridge and furrow that you can see on the screen there. And I pick this up because it's something we are a little bit proud of and we'd like to think of as a sort of public good. Um, you'll see in that picture that it's quite flat around us. It's very fertile and there's a lot of very intensive arable agriculture around us. And I think most people would consider that to be a more profitable use of the land. However, the cloughs over the last hundred years have refused point blank to plough up any of their beautiful ridge and furrow. It is not the most productive uh, grassland. It hasn't been reseeded. You can still see all the lines there, but we think it is a, a pleasure to look at. And it's a piece of history through the local area that really ought to be looked after. We graze our sheep on cover crops over the winter. That's something we've been doing for quite a few years now. The cattle are housed in winter as around us, it's just too marshy and the number of cattle we've got, we think it would just be too wet. So in 2017, we got the opportunity to go on the Prince's Farm Resilience Programme and it has definitely empowered my husband and I to step up and make some of our ideas and plans into a reality. Um, the picture you'll see here is my daughter in a field of lucerne. Now, for the lucerne uh, buffs here, they will know that that has gone past the ideal stage of <laughs> silaging. But for us on a mixed farm, when the combines are rolling, the silage has to wait. And for me, I quite like that because it means there are more butterflies that the children can go and run around and catch in the uh, lucerne. We've been growing lucerne since 2007 or Martin has, I should say. Um, he'd seen it grown in New Zealand when he went traveling as a youngster and he really liked the idea of a nitrogen fixing crop. Before we started the Prince's Farm Resilience Programme, I used to walk around on the farmyard with the kids when they were toddlers. Every morning we'd go out in our wellies and we'd watch the boys feeding up with all the silage bales that we would unwrap and place in each crew yard in a ring feeder. And it was on the surface, a very simple and cheap way of feeding it. And I began to ask them questions about the lucerne and why they used the lucerne just as a normal bale of silage. At that stage, they weren't getting any of their silages anal analyzed. And when I asked why, they said they'd had it done several years ago, but they hadn't really understood all the figures that came back from it. So they didn't do it again. And I, began to read up on lucerne and I sort of learned that it could be a really high protein crop. And from what I'd seen in the farm office, I could see that the protein section of the feed we were feeding the cattle was generally the most expensive. So I thought, hang on, we've got a really good source of protein here, but we just don't really know about it and know how to use it. And it was during one of the workshops on the Prince's Farm Resilience Programme, uh, it was called Cost Management, that my husband lent to me and said the words I had been longing to hear that were, I think we better go to that nutritionist you were talking about. So with his uh, blessing, I went and found an independent nutritionist and we discussed the pros and cons and learned a bit more about where our, the lucerne could be better used in our feed. We did a partial budget, which we had learned in one of the other workshops and we decided we could afford to invest in a feeder wagon, which is shown here, and also a roller mill, which is too boring to take a picture of, really. Um, now, they have enabled us to be much more self-sufficient. We now roll and ourselves all of the corn that we grow on farm that we feed to the cattle. We still buy in a small amount of soya, 
but this year we are growing beans on farm and depending on how that goes that might be a solution for our protein needs going forwards making us almost entirely self-sufficient for forage and feed grown on the farm. Now, is it the right thing? Well, we have to bear in mind that the amount of diesel we use on the farm over winter has gone up considerably, and that is something I am keeping a tight eye on. But one thing I can say for sure is that the cattle look much better for it. So we're certainly winning in one respect. Now, the Cloughs have been using a Suffolk Tup on a North of England mule since about 1980. And apparently, according to other people, that's a really old school thing to do. Just before we started the Prince's Farm Resilience Programme, it occurred to us that maybe this wasn't what the buyers around here really wanted anymore. So we have since begun buying mule cross texels. And I just wish we'd made the switch sooner. The lambs are definitely more desirable at market. When we get the market reports back, you can see which pens sold for the most money, and it is always the mule cross texels sell better for us. And the mule cross texel ewe actually needs less concentrate to maintain their body condition score over the winter, which was something we didn't realise until the first year we had them when we turned them out with all our other ewes. And when it came in to lambing time, they were fat as butter. So we have a ewe that takes less feed to maintain herself over winter and we have a lamb that sells better and for more money that is definitely more resilience built into our sheep enterprise. Now I had had an ambition to sell our own beef and lamb for a very long time and it wasn't going away. Martin my husband was not keen he didn't have the time to help he couldn't really see that there'd be enough customers but I just couldn't stop thinking about it. So after the Prince's Farm Resilience Programme, I decided that I was just going to do it anyway. I used social media to find customers, and that was a little bit easier than I thought it was going to be. I have found it is profitable. It's not going to make me a millionaire. But over the 18, last 18 months, I've worked hard, and I can sell one beast a month and four to seven lambs. Now... That is only a small proportion of the finished stock we produce. And I knew that I would only be doing a small proportion, but I was hoping that just a small benefit would be worth it. The limit to further expansion, I thought, would be the limit of customers. But actually, to my surprise, it doesn't seem to be. The limit is more that I, my butcher that I use is a full-time butcher himself. And he works for me in his spare time and if I wanted to employ my own butcher, I'd need my own facilities. Now, that would be quite a large investment. And particularly in the face of reducing subsidies, it doesn't seem like it would be a wise thing to consider. Now, the first Prince's Farm Resilience Programme workshop that we did was a business health check. And it was really memorable, mainly for the enormous headache that we had about halfway through and it didn't leave for several hours afterwards. I think we all realised from that meeting that we need to do more farm analysis and more data capture. Office work is not just about coffee and biscuits. Like most farmers, animal husbandry and agronomy just dominates our lives. We leave no time for the farmer's analysis needed to make good management decisions. My husband finds it really quite frustrating when we are at home and he wants to come in and do something that we feel is important in the office. He often sees a little bit of reluctance from his dad and our stockman. And I think this might be opinions that are seen elsewhere as well. Farming is done outside, not in the office. It's really not helpful when you say that you want to go in the office and what they really think you're going to do is go and have a coffee, eat some biscuits and just do a bit of chatting and browsing on Facebook or something. It really is so important. It just couldn't be more wrong. If you can't understand a balance sheet, when the accountant gives you your papers at the end of the year, you're not even going to be able to know whether you've had a good year or not. If you can't forecast some income coming in, you know, do a cost benefit analysis, how can you make know whether you're making the right decisions or not? Farms are businesses and we need to understand this. After our time in the farm resilience programme, 
I began to realize that as well as the knowledge and skills we had learned, it's largely down to attitude. My husband is a great optimist. He probably had to be because he married me. But aside from that, he's always talking about what we can do to make next year better. And that's the farm I'm talking about, not our relationship. We really need to write it down. It's all right saying it over a cup of tea, but if you don't write it down and find it somewhere else, find it when you need it the next year, you're not going to be able to make the small changes that can actually make significant savings in the long run. Are we being open-minded? I love to ask the question, why? And I don't love the answer because granddad did it that way. I don't mean to be disrespectful. Obviously, there's a huge amount of knowledge that gets passed down through the generations. But does that theory stand up to modern science? It's not rude to ask, and then at least you have a better answer than just because granddad did it that way. And this really leads on to humility. Can we admit to mistakes? Can we admit that maybe granddad wasn't right? Can we make a U-turn if we realise that actually granddad was right originally and we're the ones that were wrong? Having the self-confidence to admit that we're wrong is really important. Learning from mistakes is key to finding the right solutions for any business in any sphere. So reflecting on how it's affected our business, have we improved our business performance and profitability? Yes. Is it enough for our livestock enterprises to survive without subsidies? Not really, but there is less of a shortfall to make up with environmental land management payments. But until we know what they are for and how much they will be, it's impossible to know. Is there more we can do? Definitely. So what next for us? Well, we've got a 50% share in a direct drill with a neighbouring farm and looking for other opportunities to share machinery is definitely something we're open to. We're using the AHDB farm bench tool and benchmarking ourselves with a group of local farmers, which is something we did in the first Princess Farm Resilience Programme workshop. And that's something I plan to do continuously to provide an ongoing framework to monitor our costs and profit margins, hoping they'll be there. We're going to keep using more cover crops, learning more about the principles of regenerative agriculture, because resilience can be in your soils, not just in your business. I'm going to still keep selling the lamb and beef, but only when time allows. I need to prioritise my time on farm analysis and the benchmarking, because that's where I'm really going to have a bigger impact on the viability of the farm in the long term. We're carefully planning the use of the remaining subsidies we should receive to pay for the most urgent farm investments. And then we're planning to pause investments on the farm until we can show a profit for whatever is necessary. I think with all the knowledge out there and all the op opportunities that there are, keeping an ear to the ground and being ready and open-minded to adapt and change at the right time should see us all right. I think with a bit of luck, we should be able to keep plowing our little furrow for many years to come. Although I'm not sure if plowing a furrow is the right analogy if we're talking about going minimum tillage. Thank you. Back to Kate. Thank you, Lizzie, so much. That was brilliant. I just um, noting down some of the real kind of key areas that we've been thinking about within um, building these resilient um, sort of livestock systems and breeding, feeding, marketing, data, technical sort of um, challenges, confidence and commitment to change, collaboration. You got you got it all. Direct marketing. You like covered a whole heap of ground there. So that's amazing. Thank you so much. So if you've got questions for Lizzie, then do please pop them in the chat, and then we'll um, we will be uh, addressing her once we've spoken um, to Pete and to Liz. So um, next we've got. Pete Douglas, who has um, got a background in researching endoparasites in sheep. In 2012, he started contract shepherding, and in 2014, he set up his own flock, which he runs on land rented from seven organic farms um, to fit in with their cattle and cropping or to achieve their stewardship and um, land management objectives. And I think the key thing with Pete is that he runs his business without access currently to um, support payments or agri 
environment payments, but has um, sort of collaborations and works with a whole range of landlords at different rents in order to compensate that. But he also obviously puts a lot of focus like um, Lizzie does too in, um, in breeding and in feeding and, and making the most out of forage. So um, Pete, I will just start on your first Oh, stop sharing Lizzie and I'll start sharing that one and I will pass over to you. Great, thank you Kate. Yes, as Kate said in her introduction, I started my setup in 2014. Um, having the contract shepherding arrangement I had with the estate I was working for, they had a restructuring and sold an away block of land and relinquished a rent on a block of land that I took straight over, um, which is largely, it was organic and in largely um, in stewardship for environmental measures. And with the contacts I built up locally, I was able to uh, make arrangements with the other seven farmers, which are largely almost bordering. So this picture of um, moving, a, moving sheep down the lane is what I hope to do most of the time instead of using a vehicle um, a vehicle and a wagon to move things around. It's, uh, it's quite a nice old fashioned way of doing things, I think. Um, so I run about 450 ewes in the flock and um, with, with all the different landlords, you can just about manage to make things work to fit everything in. I think probably one of the biggest things I've learned is always having that extra, extra field of grass up your sleeve because you never know when someone's going to change, them, change their mind at a moment's notice and say they need to put some horses in the field or something like that. Um, so it, and it's also balanced between, um, I think one of the main focuses I have is trying to focus on what I can control what, rather than what I can't control. Lots of the other farmers have, have, have different things going on on their farm. So my focus is mainly on, on the sheep, on the breeding, on the animal health. So if they're in, if they're in good condition and, and trying to plan around the blocks of ground and when they're available, um, when, you, when, you, when I tot up how much ground is available in a year, it's quite a larger area that sometimes the sheep might only be on that for, um, for a week or two weeks before moving on. Um, one of the dairy farmers I work with has a couple hundred acres of red clover, which the, the agreement we have is the sheep don't spend more than a week in any one place when they're in the autumn. So they move on and on and on. And it's actually a very good way of finishing lambs that way. So um, the trade off with the moving sheep around all the time is, um, is, is gained by having access to lots and lots of clean grazing, which I don't think can be underestimated in, in the sheep world. <clears throat> uh, one of my landlords put in a solar park in 2013 and then scratched his head and wondered what he was going to do with controlling the grass under it. So uh, he gave me a call and wondered if I wanted to put some sheep on it. Um, and it's actually worked really, really well. I move, um, it, it's quite a heavy site and I move sheep, I move ewes on there for lambing, probably about 180 ewes there for lambing in, in early April and they start lambing from mid-April and my biggest problem at lambing is ravens. I, everything lambs outside and the panels actually provide a lot of shelter and I expected to have problems in some of the open areas but the ravens don't seem to bother me at all there um, and that's been, that's been, a, a, been a real plus point. Um, my setup is fairly easy in some respects and I have a vehicle, a, a livestock trailer, handling kit, things like a wake crates, lots of electric fencing. Um, which allows me to be pretty nimble in terms of in terms of moving around and being able to take opportunities. And uh, one of the biggest things I've learned from working with different landlords is building up a good relationship with them because you never know where um, where that might take you. It leads to all sorts of different work with helping neighbours to TB testing when they've got you know, five six hundred cattle to test on a dairy um, with relief milking. Um, I've got a small tractor which um, I do some topping at the solar panels and because I'm known to them and the security on that site it means I can go I can I can earn extra money in addition to the um, in addition to, to, to the, my income from the, um, from the sheep with with doing different bits of work like that and it, it's not to be underestimated how um, how much additional work you can fit in around the sheep um, can come without having to travel too far um, working with your neighbours. Uh, one of the neighbours that I have is also a um, is a dairy farmer with an arable setup, and I work with um, after his uh, spring cropping. I, I put in a, a mixed brassica crop 
uh, to follow that over winter, which just as the red clover and the other grazing I prioritise for my lambs in the autumn is going over, they then go on to a, onto a mix of stubble turnips, forage rape, Egyptian clover and, and a radish. And the lamb, I just moved some lambs onto there yesterday and they seem to do really well on that mix. Um, it's only a small area, but it's, um, it, it, it's, it's worth more than its weight in gold at this time of year for, for getting those later lambs to, just, to, just to get some finish. Um, this is a photo of lambs just after clipping and uh, lambs <laughs> being largely permanent pasture. It's amazing you're talking about resilience. Well, resilience also needs to happen in terms of drought resilience. And this year we've had, or the third, third spring running, we've had some very dry conditions in this part of the world in uh, North Wiltshire and the Southern Cotswolds. And the permanent pasture has really performed very well compared to other sown, sown fields. Um, I have three fields I've got control of um, to, to reseed and, and, and crop as I want. And, and they're all now all in herbal lays, which again have performed very well. And I'm hoping to dovetail this with my neighbour who grows the um, who grows the spring barley for his cattle, and to bring my three fields of that into to, to marry up with his rotation. So when his fields are back in back in grass, he can put herbal lays in on his farm, and uh, we can do the cropping on mine on my ground and have the uh, have the winter cropping area there as well. Um, one of the aspects of breeding that I focused on. Um, all my ewes are, are clean ewes, apart from there's a few in this photo here, which are Highlanders, which are, which are a composite breed from New Zealand, which I'm just trying for the first time this year. Um, I don't usually tuck ewe lambs um, that I keep. I keep about 80 to 100 of my own ewe lambs a year. Um, I don't usually tuck ewe lambs, but they've grown so well this year that, um, uh, that they are going to be tucked. And um, we shall see, what, see, see how those go. I, I, I acquired a Highlander tuck as well. And um, it's going to be interesting to, to see the outcome of that in terms of purebred breeding replacements. Um, I took two groups um, to, to Clin or Highlander, and then uh, the other the, the other group have Hampshire Down or Charolais tucks put across them, and you really get um, very impressive. And those tucks also go in. I run the first cycle with purebred tucks, and then I I, I put in um, terminal sweeper sweeper sires across the tupping groups. And those later born lambs from those, from those crosses, they really do grow well and catch up and um, provide very good lambs. And um, I've got some very good prices at local markets recently. Um, marketing is also something that I need to be quite nimble on as well. I'm, I'm perfectly prepared to sell live weight, dead weight stores if the price is right and, 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 the, and the market's there. And that helps balance, balance up the amount of grass I've got available. <clears throat> um, and I also do some direct selling. I'll probably sell between 50 to 60 lambs direct through the year. We've got um, two very good small local abattoirs and butchers associated with them um, who can do a greater or lesser extent of processing for making burgers or sausages, depending on the, on the time of the year. And that's also a very useful outlet for some of the, um, some of the, some of the lambs that, uh, that don't necessarily fit a commercial spec or wouldn't sell as well at market, but they do a very good job uh, going going through a whole or half um, meat box or something like that. <clears throat> the one of my main focuses and, and, and interests is on wildlife and biodiversity and the, and the main central block of block of land is permanent pasture but with incredible bio, biological diversity on some of the banks. Um, this orchid um, was a picture of an orchid was taken in a field with 78 flowering species not including trees um, I'm not very good on grass identification. There's a there's a lot of different grasses on some of these bits of ground as well. Um, there are three triple SIs across there, and although I don't directly benefit from having um, subsidy payments, effectively they contracted out the stewardship objectives for that block of land uh, for me to achieve on a grazing pattern where we work on flowering dates and by the calendar to have grazing on certain blocks early in the season and then, then shut up so you have, have wildflowers um, being able to seed like this or you have early cutting to remove fertility and then 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 like grazing and then leaving it for, for later flowering and there's an incredible amount of insect diversity which leads to bat and bird diversity in turn as well and I'm seeing some of the meadows with my daughters this summer when we walked across this field we found 43 species between us um, I have to brush up on my botanical knowledge to uh, to meet my daughter's uh, 
thirst for their own thirst for knowledge. Um, and we probably missed a couple as well, because there's a couple of species there that uh, um, that I couldn't identify. And here's a photo of the mix I grow after my neighbour's spring barley. Um, it's a mix I, I developed myself. And I think um, mixes are good because where one thing doesn't grow, something else does grow. Uh, so in here, it's, it's mainly forage rape, probably about 50% forage rape. And then about um, the rest of it is split between Egyptian clover, which is a tall plant standing up in the background in amongst the forage rape, um, a small amount of stubble turnip, and then this for, uh, fodder radish called Mino daikon, um, which in if the ground is deep enough, it can grow to about, the root can grow about 15 inches. So hopefully you're not only providing winter cover, but on that ground uh, with the cultivator that we've got, um, we've got a, a, a one pass uh, disc harrows with a cedar on it. Uh, you can go from stubble to planting. It's got a roller on the back as well, and then it's rolled again. And we can put some slurry on at that point as well. So it gives a bit of a bit of a, an irrigation and, and nutrient boost. Um, and then you're left with a crop like this, which is um, average probably is knee, about knee high. The lambs almost disappeared into it when I put them on there yesterday. And um, you're providing winter cover, good feed, plus also uh, returning a bit of fertility to the ground as well. And that'll go back in. It's a three-year rotation of, of cereals, and then it goes back into a, back into a red clover or herbal lay. And um, I think uh, when stewardship comes round for renewal and seeing what forms that comes in, I, I've got good enough relationships with the landlords so we can start to see to work what works for what works for everybody. Thanks very much, Pete. That's brilliant. We've covered a huge amount of ground there <laughs> in a very short amount of time and some uh, well chosen photos. Thank you. And it just it really demonstrates, you know, that ability to be flexible and to, you know, have a situation where you can meet the needs of, of, of different landowners and, and be able to deliver for them, particularly in terms of their environmental um, requirements. But then, you know, with arable, arable rotation as well, there's a whole load of flexibility. So brilliant. I'm sure there'll be loads of questions for you. So thank you. Hold fire for a second. So um, as we're rattling through our time as ever, um, I will just... Um, move on to Liz. So Liz Jennifer, she um, works a huge amount with um, sort of progressive beef and sheep farmers, particularly those who are introducing um, livestock into their arable businesses. Um, I'm sure lots of you will uh, know of her and she's got a vast technical background in sheep and beef fertility, breeding, uh, grass and forage management, and then also um, farms in South Lincolnshire herself. So I'm going to hand straight over to her I can get my next slide. There we go. Next slide to come up. And, um, and she's going to talk us through this very exciting slide. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so, yeah, I'm, so, I'm really sorry I haven't got some really nice photos like you've just seen. Um, I thought I'd, I would do a slightly different approach. So I don't know whether you're familiar with the book that's at the bottom left. Um, and it's about the sort of seven habits of highly effective people. And you can see on the in the diagram on the screen, um, those are the seven habits. And um, if you if you'd like to indulge me for the next five, 10 minutes is to talk through in terms of what I see um, in the farmers I work with and sort of have conversations with that are really starting to challenge their systems um, and are very aware of what is coming down the line and want to be ready for it. Um, so what am I seeing sort of fitting along these seven habits that those farmers are also doing? Um, so I'm going to start at the top. So with the be proactive side um, and there's some really nice examples of the um, from Lizzie and Pete that we've just heard about in terms of making sure we've got the right stock for the system and also quite simple systems. Um, the, the vast majority of beef and sheep farms probably have two or three too many classes of stock or different types of animals so they might have two or three lambing groups they might have two or three calving groups and all of that tends to lead to complexity and uncertainty about which one needs certain management at certain times so the simpler that we can make systems um, the easier it is to manage and certainly from a grazing management perspective which we'll talk on in a bit 
is um, it makes it easier if we're moving towards more of a rotational grazing system. Again, it's easier to manage when you've got stock with relatively similar uh, requirements for energy and protein. Um, and what we're, we're tending to talk on these really high grass and forage based systems. So again, we've heard some really nice examples from them earlier. Um, and that is also we're trying, we're particularly interested in animals from a mature size perspective, because that's really driving these sort of um, more outdoor based systems. And we're also interested in animals that have foraging behaviour. So those ones that can really, really quickly utilise and effectively utilise that grass and forage and turn it into condition score or, or lamel um, sort of live weight gain performance. So it is about identifying what stock is most appropriate for your system, but also probably thinking about is this system the one I should be running on the farm or has it evolved as sort of Lissy suggested over many generations and actually it started out being the right one but all of a sudden our policy and government sort of drivers have changed dramatically so actually we do need to have a start we have to have a look at ourselves and see whether that system needs some improvement. So moving on to begin with the end in mind and again we've heard some nice examples of direct selling but also Pete's flexibility in terms of um, being able to sell stock based on what that, um, so whether it's live weight or dead weight. But I think it's that idea that we, to recognise that these beef, to recognise beef and lamb producers are food producers, um, we have a huge role to play in terms of the delivery of public goods. Um, we already store hundreds of tonnes of carbon under the soils that we manage. We have a potential to increase that further. We're also responsible for storage of water. Um, we're not high chemical users. We have a huge amount of opportunities. Um, we're not, we're food producers, but we're also, how can we um, sort of get the value of, of the other public goods we're doing? And again, the, the sort of changes in policy that we're seeing will help us get to those points. Um, there's opportunities to add value and a couple of the queries that came through, particularly when Lizzie was speaking, was about pasture fed. So are there systems that can go 100% grass and forage? Um, certainly for beef and sheep systems, it's technically very, very achievable to do that. Um, I also argue that some particularly ruminants are very capable of, of using a wide range of co-products. So actually to maybe to artificially so it has to be 100% grass and forage can sometimes limit sort of system choices, but it is very it is very possible within beef and sheep, um, probably more so than other uh, sectors. So again, it's about recognising the value that we've already got and, and then trying to monetize that onto farm. So moving on to first things first, um, as the, of, of people who've known me or heard me speak before, I'm slightly obsessed with grass and soil. Um, huge interest in the last few years in terms of soil health and will continue to be and certainly uh, some of the challenge that grasslands have is that we have the perception that that soil is already in good conditions because it's under grassland and yes we have less degraded soils but we also need to focus on soil structure counting earthworms looking at where there is areas of compaction in those soils and also thinking about are some of the practices that we you so Jim, we've heard about cover crops but some of that sort of really highly intensive sort of root develop a root production so fodder beet we we do have consequences for soil health so we need to recognize is there bits within our system that we need to just tweak to ensure that that soil is being well managed through most of that year um, and again i mentioned this opportunity but i think carbon trading and recognizing and realizing the value of the carbon that sits below our soils is an area of probably of development in the next couple of years and that what i suppose the dream is of that is that the money coming into farm to reward for that carbon storage is then being invested to improve the technical efficiency elsewhere so we're also reducing the methane production per head or per kilo of product um, so thinking win-win and i suppose that links into what i've just talked about about, which is this idea that we have the potential to reduce inputs going onto farms so we know that we can reduce nitrogen fertilizer and we're not particularly high users within beef and sheep and we heard from about lucerne we've heard about other clovers between we have already got these the best practice 
being demonstrated on farms. It's not like we have to invent a new product or a new service or anything new. We just have to use the knowledge that is in the heads of a significant number of our farmers and apply it onto quite a lot more farms. Um, we get beaten very regularly by because of the methane that is produced from the beef and lamb sector. We have to recognise that that is a byproduct of the feed that we're, we're asking them to eat, which is human ed inedible. But that doesn't mean that we can't try and reduce emissions from I mean, thinking about fuel efficiency, thinking about how we get those animals more efficiently off our farm. And so again, so there's these opportunities of this win-win and the environmental versus production is a really clear one where if we target technical efficiency, we reduce greenhouse gas emissions off on farm. We also generally increase the profitability of those farms. So thinking, moving around to the green one, which is seek first to, to understand. And again, really nice example from Pete's talk, which is this idea of there's an element of experimentation. So you see this sort of behavior on a lot of these farms. They're willing to try things. They're also willing to stop things when they keep trying them and it just doesn't work. So they, they are also stopping is quite key to this. Um, but we know of these huge number of policy changes that like to come through. So we've got things on positive welfare coming through, health planning, environment schemes, potential challenges around transporting livestock around the country. There is a lot of information to get our heads around in terms of what our businesses could be sort of affected by in the next five to 10 years. But part of that is having a quite a clear vision. And again, that was illustrated by Lizzie's talk of, I want my farm to do this. It is robust in the decisions I'm making, both from an economic, social and environmental perspective. And the policies may help me achieve that, but I am almost not quite paddling your own canoe, but you are very certain in terms of what you want to achieve in that business. And the policies will help you achieve that rather than sort of um, chop and change and sort of make your farm fit whichever new fancy policy comes out. So the next one is synergize. So we're moving around again. And this is the idea, and again, really in some nice examples, and you see it quite frequently on these really effective farms, which is partnership working. So with neighbours in the example of Pete, um, and you've also seen this collaboration with supply chains. So there are some really nice examples coming from the sort of dairy industry with dairy cross beef being moved into that beef production because of changes in sort of thoughts about a culling policy on calves. So you've got this idea that we can we can collaborate within ourselves, we can collaborate along supply chains. And part of it is about reducing waste. Part of it is actually makes us feel good in terms of making us or helping us work together with others. Um, I'm involved in an initiative called Carbon Dating, which is trying to act as a introduction service basically to livestock farmers who want land and arable farmers who want livestock, but don't necessarily want the other way around. Um, and that's about helping livestock farmers find farms where those sheep could move for two or three months over that winter. And that would make a significant difference to the profitability of that farm and the need to bring inputs onto that farm. So can we think differently in terms of and that sort of collaboration is not um and that the challenge with that is a lot of the people that are contacting me at the moment are based in wales and a lot of the other people the arable people are based in east anglia so it, it doesn't quite fit from an environmental perspective dragging sheep around the country but the concept is there and we need to develop it a bit further and the final one for me which is the sharp and the um the saw and again some really nice examples of this idea of using data to make decisions I do a lot of work with farmers who have loads of data, have not a scooby of what to do with it. Um, so part of the part of the work I do is actually to to get to the what are the key bits of information that we need to collect and make decisions on. And if you are spending time collecting information that you do not use, just do something else. So be really clear about why you're collecting that number. If you're going to spend half a day measuring grass, make sure you use it to make your decisions and help that business move on. Um, and I think it was a not, it was that idea that this idea of if farming if you're not outside in the in all weathers getting dirty you're not really farming and it was a there was an example it was actually a dairy farmer who said that by sitting in the office for an hour he managed to save the business a thousand pounds and so recognised the importance of actually spending time in the office um, and sort of helping that business achieve more by just working differently with it. 
and that's me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you again, like covering a, a vast amount that we've managed to do so far in this workshop in terms of trying to encompass um, such a vast selection of how you're managing your land through to how you're managing your business and how you're selling and how you're collaborating all together. So um, I appreciated that we have perhaps uh, not kept to my incredibly tight schedule quite as well, but I am very aware that I have a lovely half an hour of extra time, so I'm less concerned about that. So I'm going to stop sharing that. Um, and then we're going to crack on with some of the questions. I appreciate they will have all been popping up in the chat, so you will see them, but I'm hoping my colleague um, has, yes, thank you, Helen, and she's put them lovely into this um, spreadsheet for me. So I'm going to start off with one for Lizzie. So um, have you considered reducing input still further by, uh, as Liz mentioned, about going 100% um, pasture fed and, and PFLA? So um, Lizzie, have you any thoughts on, on going 100% forage based? Yes, yeah, we have considered it and it's not a closed discussion. Uh, there are a lot of uh, effects that that would have on the farm and um, because the stock would take longer to finish than the current system we use where the bull calves are weaned in the autumn kept in over the winter and then kept in in the spring and at the moment they're finished most of them are finished at 16 or 17 months as bull calves now it's unusual but we have a local abattoir that is really keen on bull beef so we have a very convenient outlet there. My husband, oddly for a farmer, hates going to market. Waste of time, he says. He wants to take the bull to the abattoir and he's back by eight o'clock in the morning. So he really likes selling to them. Now, they are not going to want a steer that is 26 months old or something like that. So we have a market that we produce our bull beef for that to a large extent, Martin is happy with. Now, ideally, you know, in my heart of hearts, I kind of think it would be lovely to be able to have them all out at grass for another summer and then to sell them profitably at the end of that summer. But um, for me, it's a bit of an unknown. Is there really uh, a good market for them as steers that bit older? What is the price that we're likely to get for them at that stage? I know having Lincoln Reds, we've got a breed that would suit pasture for life. And it is something that we uh, often have talked about, but we would have to reduce the number of cows that we've got in order to have enough grazing to put the young stock out for another summer. So we would then be producing less calves in total. So it's one of those that it is, it is a, a matter for debate that gets brought up every couple of months. And at the moment, uh, it's never been able to convince us that that is the right thing for us to do at this moment. But it's not being uh, ruled out. Ruled out. No. Way. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. And Pete, if you, what's your situation? You're not PFLA, are you? I don't think. No, I'm not. Um, no. But the only concentrate that gets fed is to the ewes just before lambing. Sure, before lambing, um, yeah. Although this year, that was, again, with a link up with my neighbours and the price of organic ewe rolls is quite steep. And um, a chance conversation with one of my neighbours who grows lots of oats, I've I fed the ewes on whole oats pre-lambing uh, in the run to lambing this year. So it was a very cost effective way. He wanted them out of the way. I spoke to another neighbour who had a trailer that was free. So later on that morning, his grain store was empty. Another neighbour's trailer was full and I started, um, I then had, I was in control of my feed for the ewes pre-lambing. Sure. Um, I introduced them to it fairly gradually and checked the dung over a couple of days and nothing seemed to be coming through. So I increased it up to pretty much the, the rate I'll be feeding you rolls at and it it seemed to work for everybody. So um, the ewes did well on it. And um, yeah, I didn't have lots of bags to get rid of or a storage problem with having uh, you no know, bags on the pallet in a shed. It was corn in a, in a trailer and it was with a sheet on top and it was nice and secure from birds and vermin. Amazing. Yeah. So having that flexibility, obviously, it is really important. So, yeah. um, oh, someone's just quickly asked were the sheep fed anything other than oats? Um, only only molasses feed, organic molasses feed blocks and okay. mi mineral blocks. Um, I have to watch with the very high calcium levels in the soil. They do get um, extra magnesium. Um, mm -hmm. They use a bolus um, twice a year with um, uh, selenium, cobalt and iodine boluses. 
um, to help with the general um, that fits in with the, um, the deficiencies in the area, but also have to watch out for magnesium and, and avoid having um, hypomag use um, in late gestation. So they probably have from about February onwards, they have a high mag version of the same, same feed bucket um, and they do get fed hay. We make hay off the species rich areas of the, um, and the triple SIs which have to be cut. And those, those, are, those are fed back onto the less species rich areas to help with the biodiversity and the, the fields are in, in, in arable reversion. And with the fields, I've got full control over when they're mown. I, I, big bales are made on that and I make small bales on a farm where we've got easy storage and then I can feed those through the winter as well. So with this frosty weather the last week, the ewes have just been having a, an extra couple of bales each group each day just to, just to top them up. Brilliant. Well, that beautifully segues back onto another question that was for Lizzie, which was just about uh, making hay on her ridge and furrow. Have you, do you do that, Lizzie? Um, yes, we do. Um, not every field every year, um, but uh, depending on quite on the grass growth and uh, various bits of rented land that we do or don't have. Um, we have done in the past and um, we've had some very good analysis back from it we've sometimes made silage as well um it's uh yeah it's something that just works fairly well for us perfect um pete in your um cover crops uh um what cover crops do you graze and what's in your herbal lays and how long do you expect your herbal lays to last before reseeding okay um i'm aiming for four full years with herbal lays Mm -hmm. um, they were established after um, uh, all the lays I had were established after um, worn out lays had come to the end of their productive life. And they were done in the autumn by harrowing it about three or four times over a couple of weeks to get rid of rid of the old thatch. And then they were overseeded in the autumn. And given the dry springs we've had, we've had three in a row. I'd be nervous about sort of 85, 90 pounds an acre reseeding costs uh, for seed costs and then them being scorched off in a very dry spring. So they were done in late August, early September, and they were left. And I, I pretty much left that first year. They were mown in about, in about June and then very lightly grazed afterwards. And with the herbal laser, look at a paddock grazing system on that. So they will make three acre paddocks up. And the farm where those on, there's also generally a lot of small fields as well. So the small fields, the aftermath on the small fields comes into that same paddock grazing, grazing rotation. And I aim to get the ewes and lambs around that uh, you know, two to three times from um, uh, dur during the year. Um, because they were red clover in the lays before, the herbal lays don't include red clover, but they include a lot more white clovers, a lot more trefoils. So I think off the top of my head, there are about six different uh, species, not varieties, but six different species of grass um, in there. Um, and it's very dry ground as well, so that will tend to be more coxfoot and um, tall fescue and festololium heavy. Uh, so white clovers, uh, birdsfoot trefoils, yellow trefoils in there as well. Uh, chicory grows very well on this, on this ground, as does plantain and sheep's parsley and burnet as well. So there's, there's, there's a real mix in there. And um, some of the forage that was made off that, we did make small bales on a, on a, on a headland of this field and that, that turned out very well. We just wanted to sort of have a bit of an experiment to see how mowing it and not over tedding it or overturning it was going to work in terms of preventing leaf shatter and, 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 and things like that. But I'm aiming to get four full years of that grazing rotation off that. Um, then that'll be um, probably ploughed mid-summer I'd imagine that'd be the only time I'd aim, I'd aim to plough it although we might try disking it with the heavy discs to see if we can get away without having to disturb too much soil that we don't have to um, uh, so if we leave it on the surface like that and then that'll go into two to three years of cereals and then back in back into herbal lay which might be a long enough break from red clover to, to, to include red clover in the herbal lay next time Super, thank you. And just to um, blow my own trumpet for a second, I've got another session on um, Monday night at nine o'clock where I've been joined by some, some brilliant farmers who will be talking about um, other sort of resilient forage crops that they're using, including herbal lays and lucerne. And um, a, a super chap from New Zealand is going to be joining us to talk about um, how they are uh, embracing uh, resilient forage crops and, and herbal lays uh, within New Zealand. So do join me then um quickly now i will just as is we've reached five o'clock i want to officially say thank you ever so much to lizzie and pete and liz and keith um, and helen and and the orfc team with all your help and questions with technical 
technical support and everything. And I will thank you all again, but just to officially thank you all. And, um, and now I'm going to just carry on with my questions willy nilly as I've still got half an hour. Um, so I will just move on to uh, one for Lizzie. Um, and would you be able to talk a little bit more about um, the different attitudes and working into gen generationally as a family, please, um, from Fran? Any um, reflections you've got on that, Lizzie? My pleasure. It's a lot of fun sometimes. <laughs> That's a hot thing to talk about. <laughs> so out of the group in the Prince's Farm Resilience Programme, I don't think there was a family there that hadn't had a awkward moment at some point it's universal amongst all farms and um, one of the reasons why the program was so good for uh martin and i was because his dad is now 80 and just beginning to give him that bit more space to actually make some of these changes i think had we been trying to do some of these things a few years back we would have found that there was uh less willingness sort of to allow the changes to happen from his point of view um, there was a really, really fantastic talk on the programme given by a lady called Heather Wildman from Saviour Associates, and she was fantastic about uh, giving us advice on how to have difficult conversations and, um, you know, it, how important it is. And although it might be difficult, it really has to be done. I've um, sort of worked out over the years in a slightly cunning way that... Um, Martin's dad will often say he'll agree to something when he doesn't. Uh, but if I speak to Martin's mum and we talk to her about it, she's more likely to go home and then privately talk to Martin's dad about it. And then we're more likely to get a bit of a decision change there. But to be honest, there are still some things that we are having to be patient with, ideas we bring up that we think, oh, goodness me, that wasn't a good reaction. We're going to have to wait a few years before we bring that up again. Um, so... It definitely is a tricky thing that I think a lot of people suffer from. It's important and it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And you've got to keep trying gently. Um, but it's, uh, it, is, it is definitely a, a very uh, relevant subject, I think, for a lot of people. Thank you. And that's, that's a really good point about... If I could just... Sorry, yes, do, please. I'll just come in there to say that on the Resilience Programme, we encourage all members of the family if necessary to come along um, during some of the sessions it's not just restricted to one to have that wider dialogue and I think we certainly see at the moment through the agricultural transition the need for more sessions uh, around the whole subject of succession uh, going forward and how we can facilitate that within the program. Thanks. Yeah, no, and I, I was just about to say it's, it's about uh, appreciating that there is advice and support out there on how to have these difficult conversations and the fact that, you know, you don't have to approach it alone. So that's that's perfect. Um, just to another one, quick one for you, Lizzie, about um, your direct meat box scheme. Um, Charlotte's saying that she um, find that the butcher costs can make the margin so small it's hardly worth doing, um, even with an organic meat price. Can you make a decent margin on your boxes? Well, uh, I feel like I am, yes, but that depends on how you, you said it. So I, I pay the going rate or what we personally feel is the going rate. I personally pay that to the farm. So I buy the carcass from the farm and then anything I can make on the butcher's fees and the slaughtering costs is what I consider to be my margin. Now, my margin mostly depends on the uh, payment rate that I'm paying to the farm. So what we consider to be the uh, going rate varies. Now, I cannot beat the price that we get from somebody else who occasionally buys our heifers to go into restaurants in London. If I were to sell it at a price that I needed to make that kind of money on it, then it would be too expensive for all the local people to buy. For us, we are, are essentially happy with the price that I've been paying this summer, and it does leave me um, a, a £200 per beast uh, margin with which to reinvest or save as I feel necessary. Now, 
uh, whether you consider that uh, to be, you know, worth my time, it depends on how much time I put in. It equally, I would imagine that the slaughtering and the butchery costs vary quite largely between one person and another. So it depends on what your butcher charges. I think a lot of people do find that it is marginal um, and it slightly comes down to whether you really want to do it. Um, but the uh, prices as they have been for the last year for us, I'm happy with that it's been a good thing for our farm. Um, most of our heifers that we have are sold as pedigrees. It's the ones that are not good enough to go through that pedigree level of breeding that I sell as um, in my meat box. And the local abattoir that I referred to earlier that buys the bulls off us, oddly enough, they really like bull beef and they pay really badly for heifers. So for us, it's a better outlet for our heifers, but that's just our situation. And I can imagine that it won't be the same for everybody. Thank you. That's great. Um, just moving on, I got a couple of questions. Sorry. Can I just come in on that point about uh, about direct selling as well, Kate? Mm, please, please. With with my with the direct selling I do, it's probably about less than ten percent of my of my of my lamb total, or maybe it's ten percent of my my finished lambs I'm selling a year. Um, but quite often, it's the lambs I put through the direct selling is the lambs that don't fit whatever whatever spec might be going at the time. Um, my lambs come fit as they come fit. I don't. I can't. I can't push them along. I'm relying on reliant on the grass that I have in front of them. And sometimes you have a lamb that's fit, but it might be 37 kilos instead of 42, like you need for a direct weight market. So I can go into a group where I, I can take that as as a pair or three lambs, maybe once a month, um, to do for my lamb boxes. So it's very much picking and choosing. Or sometimes you get something that might have been, been um, maybe. For some reason it didn't finish that well and ends up being 50 something kilos so it might be out of spec one way uh, no the, the other way but it might well do very well going into a going into a lamb box for for the customer who wants a larger lamb or a smaller lamb and i've always got the option to pull out a, a 42 kilo prime lamb if somebody wants a middle of the road um size lamb for their freezer brilliant yeah it's that flexibility isn't it um mm -hmm. Uh, Liz, I just a uh, quick one for you in terms of uh, where can you learn more about the carbon dating project, but then also if you were able to give some thoughts on tall grass grazing for both sheep and cattle um, and allowing a sort of a more resilient sward coming out of winter, any thoughts on that? And, and equally, Pete and, um, and Lizzie, if you've got any thoughts on, on tall grass grazing, that would be great. Um, yeah carbon data the easiest um is to send me an email so that's liz at lizgeneva.com um if you i'm not sure what happens if you if you google carbon dating liz it may come up because there is a page on my website but yeah if you email me i can send you more details and i can send you the list of people who've registered an interest in either which way um in terms of tall grass grazing so most of the work that's been done has generally been in cattle and uh so most of it is about uh, the concept of tall grass is that you're going into crops that have sort of reached maturity and have been allowed to fully express themselves. Um, and then depending on whether you want non-selective or selective mob grazing, you're then aiming to for those cattle to ingest most of, most of that forage before they move on. It involves quite high stocking densities. So you're moving them quite frequently and asking them to eat in a non-selective management. You're asking them to eat everything in front of them. Um, you're probably more familiar with the eat a third, leave a third, trample a third approach. That's starting to be moved away from towards this more non-selective approach. Um, works really well in cattle, particularly older cattle that have the rumen capacity to digest that forage. Um, it doesn't work as well with younger cattle, it doesn't work as well with sheep, but it can be done with sheep. There's a bit of a risk with sheep in terms of um, it makes management quite difficult if it's that long sounds very simplistic but you lose them there's a risk of fly strike um, pasture quality isn't always as good as it would be under a rotational grazing system um, by coincidence there's a DEFRA have just funded a mob grazing project that's starting imminently I'm in, I'm involved in it in a small way but that's trying to collect the evidence from mob grazing and rotational grazing in terms of the benefit from a soil health greenhouse gas animal welfare so um, we think it's a really nice thing but that project will help us def 
understand the evidence behind that as an approach, but it can be really useful if you're trying to really rapidly increase or try to increase organic matter of soils. So on depleted, maybe arable soils that have been transitioned to livestock systems, it's quite a nice way to sort of do a booster in the first few years to get that organic matter up. Great, thanks. Lizzie and Pete, do you have any experience in, in tall grass grazing? On the stewardship ground, there are targets for how much sward length should be left at the end of grazing. Um, okay. It should be, should be in, a mo in a mosaic. So a lot of that ground, sometimes when you go into it, if it's being grazed in April and May, and then not grazed again until mid-August, like one of the options is, um, it's generally I try to have a bunch of weaned, a freshly weaned ewes to go onto that. Um, so that because sometimes the quality of the grass isn't isn't great and it's, it's it sort of suits those weaned ewes to go on there and the lambs can go on to something that's a, that's a little bit better um i suppose one of the issues i've got with animals being spread out so much is i'm very wary of bad feet and fly strike was mentioned as well so um keeping on top of making sure the animals are covered for flies is good and, I, and all the ewes get foot vaxxed as well to make sure that's the only vaccination i actually use on the sheep um but feet is one of the areas that I catching catching one ewe in a 45 acre block of grazed woodland and um, on a steep bank is something I try to avoid doing if I can possibly help it. Um, we usually end up having a bit of a bit of a tangle and a rugby tackle and it's not fun for anybody. Um, I also with the herbal lays, um, I was hoping to avoid getting away from topping it, but with moving, having a lot of sheep in one place and then moving them on and moving them on again, um, it's a case of how much they eat and how much they leave. And one patch at the end of this year was starting to look a little bit um, with tall bits of dead grass on it rather than rather than lush stuff growing. So whether I'm going to have to come back and, and, and look at that. Um, I it never really got tall enough to lose any animals in it. Um, but with paddocking up with electric fence, that was something else to you know, strimming a strip ahead so that um, the fence could go in straight lines to make up the paddocks or something that was in the length of sward was interfering with the electric fence. Okay, um, Lizzie, um, and also uh, just sorry, I'm just conscious of time and thinking about some of the other questions. If you any thoughts on tall grass grazing and also the dreaded COVID and in terms of any impact on your businesses and the, the decisions or plans that you'll be making, Lizzie? Um, I think the only impact of COVID on our business really fortunately has just been an increased demand through the box scheme last year. Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, my father-in-law wouldn't stop coming to the farm if it was the plague. Um, <laughs> but uh, fingers crossed he's been to have his uh, vaccination this afternoon. So happy days for a few weeks time and hopefully some antibodies for him. Yeah. Um, tall grass grazing, no, that wasn't on our radar. Uh, mob grazing and rotational grazing, yes. It's one of those things that's been uh, discussed a, for a while. And at the moment we're coming up with a lot of reasons why it's not appropriate for us at this moment in time. I would be quite surprised if you came back in 10 years time and we weren't doing it to some scale. But at the moment there have been other investments and other things that needed sorting first that were more a point of getting us to where we should be rather than trying to improve us from a sort of a good average. Um, one of which being a livestock trailer, uh, a, you know, a proper tractor mounted one. At the moment, we just have one that we tow behind the truck. And a lot of our fields are very small field sizes. So the rotation would quite quickly uh, end up being a lot of animals moving from field to field and unfortunately they're not all next to each other so um, there would be a bit of infrastructure needed to make that feasible but it is definitely something I think we will get around to doing in the long term. Super. Um, just quick one back to your direct sales in terms of do you, are you costing in your labour with your direct selling Costing. So when I said that there was a £200 margin at the end of that, that was not on top of my labour, that is including my labour. Now, um, there is a lot labor, less labour that goes into selling a beast now than there used to be, uh, because I have an, an email list of customers and I can trust that they'll turn up. I don't charge my time for a day where I sit in the house in the office waiting for people to come in because I'm doing lots of other work whilst I'm waiting for people to come and pick it up from the fridge. 
Um, but uh, yeah, the sort of like I say, the, the 200 pounds I have left over includes my time that I spend on it. Okay, perfect. Um, right, I think we're getting through them. So uh, thank you ever so much for all these brilliant questions. It obviously makes the whole session um, just really fly when you've got all these super things to talk about. So um, Liz, uh, soil carbon, is yeah. there, um, so obviously with the joy of, um, obviously we're trying, and there's another question which I know has been related in terms of being able to push forward with government the value of grasslands in terms of storing soil carbon and how we can try and get away from this you know negative press around um, cattle and sheep and lamb and and beef um, consumption as it's linked to sort of high greenhouse gas but then you obviously have the benefits of all of those um, grasslands that they're grazing as you obviously identified in your talk but um, is there a clear and simple agreed protocol yet on measuring soil carbon that can be used so the one i use um for the is loss on ignition is the test so it's a there's a relatively straightforward protocol during it goes to your standard soil test in lab you just have to ask for the organic matter percentage to be calculated and mm -hmm. um, there's some nice resources from ahtb taking you through the different ones on their healthy so um not healthy soils um great soils website um and then we have to remember of that about 50% of that organic matter is carbon. So we, there's some always a bit of confusion about organic matter and carbon, but it's around just about 50%. A lot of it is to do with protocols and soil depth. So we can, we can generally um, increase carbon on the surface quite rapidly, and not that rapidly, five, 10 years, but it, it's how it then works itself through that soil profile. Um, so they're relatively well established, yes. The challenge we have generally is that a lot of the carbon footprinting tools, although they're changing, doesn't tend to capture carbon storage and sequestration. They're starting okay. to. And, and that's because it will vary on soil type, rainfall, previous management, future management. So it's a really difficult one just to predict a number. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly there's quite a lot of information building and there's some nice resources and there's a big translation piece of work needed. So there's loads of evidence and people have done lots of really nice reports, but the how bit is the bit that's a bit of a gap at the moment on how we really focus on what to do. Um, and so, and I've, I've also seen the one on, there's a question the greenhouse on greenhouse gases. gases. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, um, so yeah, so the, the, I didn't wish, to, I didn't talk about it. So the, the piece of work that's come out or probably a year or so ago about methane and actually methane is, huge from a ruminant perspective do you mean most of our emissions are coming from methane from the rumen bit of the ruminant um and the idea is actually it breaks down really rapidly in the atmosphere so it's not as potent potentially but it's not as potent as co2 or nitrous oxide um really nice science really nice evidence what we have to try not to do is keep using it as an excuse not to do anything do you mean it gives us a really positive message but that doesn't mean that we don't have to try and improve our technical efficiency or try and reduce fuel use or all of those factors um i think a bit like carbon sequestration easy for me not to say we have to keep trying we keep passing the buck to other bits and actually we need to we need to look at our own businesses and see what we all can do rather than just keep searching for the new bit of science that's going to try and defend our current activities because we can't just keep doing what we do mm -hmm. absolutely um, so there's a question I was just wanted to raise on um, natural, natural anthelmintics, um, just as well to point out there's a workshop session on Sunday lunchtime, 12 o'clock, um, which is specifically looking at alternatives to anthelmintics, um, a load of work from the RELAX project, um, and uh, well use of um, alternative forage crops or different forage crops that have anthelmintic properties, but then also um, particularly the use of heather and some other um, micro fungi that can help um i didn't know uh pete particularly obviously you've been grazing uh selections of different forest crops we've seen sanfoin and things within your herbal lays and I, I know you mentioned before about um obviously worm counts and fecal egg counts and things um so are you feeling like that diverse lay is sufficient to provide a natural worm or are you still drenching I'm not sure if it provides a natural worm. Right, I, um, the the sheep uh, the ewes of fecal egg counted um, every every fortnight or so just to build up a picture of what's of what's happening. 
um, and generally I'm, I'm happy with where their, their, their worm burden is. <clears throat> um, the medicine I mainly have to use is flute because of some of the wet ground that they're on. And that's okay. something that's sort of that's fairly universal. So, but using a specific flucicide, you can you can control that without actually overusing um, using white, yellow, or clear drenches. Um, in terms, of my worming approach for the lambs is that it's done on on body condition observation and um, and dag scoring. And if something's not doing so, I've probably wormed about forty or fifty lambs so far this year, um, and I've I've sold two thirds of my lambs. So that it's not really holding anything back desperately. And I think the grazing on the diverse swords is they're growing so well. I'm not sure it's providing, um, they're not being held back by, by worm burden because of the quality of the sword they're grazing. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether it's providing a natural anthromintic or they're just efficiently using that food using it. Sure. To, to, to get on top of it. And, to, and with making sure the mineral, there's no mineral deficiencies, hopefully I've covered most of those off. So nothing's lagging behind you to lack of minerals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly something I spoke to a vet about recently in terms of some of these diverse lays providing that what you would see is a natural anthromintic, but it's actually probably more about how they're grazing them and the fact that they're they're grazing from, you know, not too close to the soil, which is actually mm -hmm. helping, you know, prevent them getting mm -hmm. contact. Yeah, um, but certainly I think things like the, the chicory, sandfoin, plantain, um, the trefoils, they all, they all have a part of, they're all providing di slightly different forms of protein. I think certainly if you're trying to get an animal to grow, it's like an Olympic athlete, doesn't it? If they eat twice, twice as much steak, they won't be they won't put on twice as much muscle mass, but they're taking protein from all these different sources. And I think that's probably that probably comes into play with how their rumens are diverse and can cope with that difference, the different nu nu nutrient sources, and then convert that into, into, into flesh and fleece or milk. Okay, brilliant. Just in the last few minutes, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna put the moles question to you, um, in terms of um, what, uh, what how are you managing moles, or um, in terms of their value for creating. You know, obviously they are amazing at, at soil cultivating and providing good soil. But um, I appreciate when you're um, harvesting uh, forage, they can be a challenge. Do you control moles, Pete? I don't control moles. We have lots of moles around. I, I regularly flatten out the mole hills as I'm walking across the field. Um, but it, it's uh, it's it's living living with them. We don't really have any in the. I think the, the soil's too shallow on a lot of the fields of the moan. Um, so we don't seem don't seem to get them in there. So I, I tolerate them, and it's to me it's a sign of it's an apex predator underground. So it's showing that lots of them um, got lots of worms. The, yeah, the soil, the soil health is good. So um, absolutely. Yeah. Excellent, perfect. Our concept. worms are completely uncontrolled, also. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please. Excellent. Thank you. Brilliant, both of you, for being um, appreciating the value of the moles. Um, I think we've covered everything else, and obviously, we've only got a few minutes left. So, I just wanted to highlight someone was obviously, I, I mentioned before about. Um, being able to really push forward with government in terms of the value of grasslands. And I think, you know, going forwards, thinking about how beef and sheep farmers are going to be able to embrace the opportunities that we are within the environmental land management scheme and being able to not, you know, in some cases use their stock as land managers. Um, and I think that, it, you know, it's, it's real big, um, sort of collective effort that we need to really be carrying on getting across if, is sharing the value of grasslands in terms of carbon um, sink, but also, you know, obviously massive value for biodiversity. I just wanted to highlight um, the Farming for Change report that the Food and Farming Countryside Commission released yesterday. And that really does embrace um, the value of ruminants and how, and, and the role that they play um, within particularly a rotational system that allows us to get grasslands and pasture back into arable systems and the value that they then bring to the arable system to um, for soil health breaking pest and disease cycles building facility and all of those um, and all of those benefits so it's a combination of the value of the permanent pastures and what they can deliver and how we need stock to make value of those grasslands and to increase biodiversity because obviously a lot of them um, if you have grazing you get more biodiversity um, but then also the value of grasslands and the and the importance 
of stock within an arable rotation and what that's doing in terms of building fertility and enabling you to reduce obviously chemical inputs and fertilizers and pesticides so yeah anyway do look at that report but um but yeah it just takes me to say again thank you ever so much to everyone for coming and all of your questions um, massively to Lizzie and Liz and Pete for all your brilliant presentations and your responses to all the questions you're perfect um to Keith thank you ever so much for joining us and, and talking about the programme and co-chairing with me and to Helen um, for helping with all of the questions. Um, do obviously follow up with, um, with myself and my colleagues um, and if you've got further things you'd like to talk to us about. I think there's opportunities that Helen will have put in the chat to have one-to-ones and, and discussions with us, particularly about the Taking Stock programme. But, um, but otherwise, yeah, have a, have a lovely evening and, and whatever you're watching next. And, um, and, and thank you ever so much. Um, I shall leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Bye. Bye.